Good evening. We're so glad to be with you tonight. This is Discover the Joy TV ministry. We teach the Word of God, and I am Sandy Harrell, and we uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. And some of you may just be flipping the stations. Well, we hope that you'll stop and join us tonight uh, because we do a verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. We're in <clears throat> Acts, the second chapter, and there's nothing more important than any of us being in the Word of God and learning the Word of God. For one thing, it's going to grow you spiritually. For another thing, you see how God's plan for this world and for each one of us individually is laid out and what a personal God He is and how His Word will guide us and teach us and comfort us and uh, without it in the turmoil that our world is in today, uh, you can tell that it just seems ev like everything is spinning out of control. And so we encourage you to go get your Bible right now if you don't have it. And if you don't have a Bible, part of our ministry is to actually uh, mail out uh, free Bibles to those who can't afford them. And it doesn't cost you anything. We pay for the postage. We pay for the Bible. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things. I, I was already thinking how close we're, before we know it, Christmas will be here. And through the years, the gifts that I've given to my kids and to friends and to other loved ones, and, you know, you could give nothing more important than a Bible. But don't wait till Christmas to give it. So if you don't have a Bible or your loved one that you may be praying for does not have a Bible, we encourage you to call. And the number will be on the screen throughout the program. We also use that same number for a prayer line. We have many people who call and request prayer. And if you call and request prayer, we're going to pray with you while you're on the phone. But we will continue to pray for you through the coming weeks. Um, I, want, I, I want to be a prayer warrior and others that work here in the ministry, they're the same, they're, that is exactly their heart's desire. We want to see souls saved and lives changed and spiritual growth in those who each Tuesday evening and, or it might be early on Thursday morning you view the program and we want and hope and pray that you are growing spiritually. If you do not know Jesus Christ, tonight can be the night that you can secure your eternal destination in Him. Okay, if you have your Bible, turn to Acts, the second chapter. And uh, last week we were talking about that the 120, that included the... Uh, I don't know if that included the uh, 12 uh, apostles at that time or if it was 120 more because it talks about the apostles. But then in verse uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 15, it also talks that there was about 120 more. They, on the day of Pentecost, we had covered how their, the promised Holy Spirit had been sent from Heaven above, from the Father, Jesus said, My Father will send you the gift, another one that's going to comfort you. I have to go, but God's going to send you another. And there is the Godhead, and that's God the Father, God the Son, which is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays no less uh, active part in the Godhead than Jesus Christ the Son, but the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself. He is always pointing to Jesus Christ. He always woos. He draws others to Jesus Christ. That is his job. When Jesus left this earth, went back to heaven after he uh, had his, well, of course, at approximately 33 years old, he began his earthly ministry and for about three to three and a half years he taught these disciples and others and many believed and many stood and listened and did not believe just as many do not believe today and 
after he was crucified, died that once and for all, that sin offering was paid at Calvary, and then he was resurrected, and 40 days later he ascended back into heaven, he will come again. He kept his promise the first time. God the Father did. He said, I will send the Messiah. He did. And he will come again the second time, just as he promised the first time. But during that time, the, Jesus promised these disciples, I have to go away, but when I do, there's going to be a gift. It's going to be the Comforter. And God, will, God the Father will send him. They, and he told them when he ascended, when they literally saw him ascend into heaven to go back and to pray, to stay together, pray, and that to wait on the gift, on the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they had no idea when it was coming, but we found last week on the day of Pentecost, they were there to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. That was the, their celebration for Thanksgiving for the crops that the Lord had given them and blessed them with through the last year. And then while they were there, there was a rushing mighty wind. And not only they heard the rushing mighty wind, and then they saw the sights. And it was, the sign was, uh, it says, at uh, tongues as a fire that descended on this, on these, not just the 12 apostles, but on the 120 disciples that had been gathered there. They received the baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I wanted to cover that so that we could begin tonight and talk about some of the work of the Holy Spirit. There are seven ministries of the Holy Spirit today. Now, once that event took place, when you're saved, when you say, I cannot save myself, I am a sinner, and you cry out to God and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and to save your soul, you are immediately saved. As quick as I can snap my finger, immediately you're saved. Once you're saved, you receive the indwelling, the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And there are seven ministries of the Holy Spirit that the believer receives. We receive them all at the same time. There is uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which these disciples and believers received on the day of Pentecost. We don't have to see the tongue, the, the fire, the, the tongues that were as a fire any longer because the, our salvation immediately brings the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God living in the believer. The Holy Spirit will not live in an unbeliever. But once you've been saved, God opens that door, immediately you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just as I mentioned, you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You also receive the seal of the Holy Spirit and the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Now, the seal, we've talked about it before. Back in the days of kings, uh, they had a seal, and each nation, the king of each nation had a seal, and they would wear a ring, and in a uh, hot uh, wax, they would put their finger, that ring, the, in, the insignia of that ring into that wax, and in whatever document that they were uh, saying was legal, they would take that ring, and that uh, seal would be in, on the ring. In fact, if you uh, here in Arkansas, when you're born, you have a birth certificate. And that birth certificate has to have the seal of the state of Arkansas. And you can actually take that birth certificate and rub back and forth over it, and you can feel that that seal is the same type of thing. It, it's not just like written on the paper. It is embossed in the paper. And that is what happens to us. God puts his seal on that new believer, and that is an earnest, and the earnest means it's a deposit 
until the day we stand before God. That means that you're his, that nothing, that no one can pluck you at the, actually the scripture says, says that you, that you cannot be plucked out of God's hand. And you say, well, how big is God? God is so big that he fills this entire universe. We, our finite comp uh, little old minds cannot comprehend how great and how big God is. But the King of kings and the Lord of lords puts his seal on your soul and you are his. That's your deposit that you will have eternal life and someday you will stand before the one who bought and paid for you and that is Jesus Christ because he will be the judge. And the word says that someday every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. Because today so many people take their mouths and they use it against Jesus. They defame the name of God because they don't want to bow a knee. They do not want to accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. So now we have to be politically correct and we have to say, well, to, you pray to who, whatever God that is your God. Well, yes, you're wasting your time if you're not praying to God Almighty. And Jesus Christ is our mediator. He became our high priest when his blood was spilt at Calvary. He sits at the right hand of the Father today and he intercedes for his children. I want to give us some scripture on some of the things that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does today in this world. All the way back to Genesis, the sixth chapter, uh, verse three. We see that he strives with men, but that will only with mankind, but that will only be for a period of time. Uh, chapter six, verse three. <clears throat> Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years, and that was when the flood came and destroyed. So God says, You can what this how how you can apply this verse to yourself today, that if you're not saved and you feel that prick within your heart, within your soul, that is there something to Jesus Christ that there's a void that nothing else is filled? Alcohol, drugs, things, uh, a better job, a better car, a uh, bigger bank account, yet you may have it all, but yet there's a void within your life. That void is called a, a God void. We're all made with that. And nothing but God through Jesus Christ will ever fill that void. But he will only strive with us while we're here on this earth. The, you cannot come to Jesus Christ unless the Holy Spirit convicts you and draw you to Jesus Christ. That's part of his work. If you try to come any other way, you're going to fail. That is one way and one way only. Another thing that the Spirit does, we're going to look at John the 14th chapter and verse 20 began with verse 26 but the counselor the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything i have said to you right there in that verse look at some of the things he's the counselor he's the teacher he says he will He's, that that uh, the Father was going to send the counselor. He will teach you. He will counsel you through the word of God. He will teach you, and then he will bring to your remembrance, to your mind, the things that you studied when you need them the most. We are in a constant warfare in this world, and sad to say, most of us do not even realize that it's a spiritual warfare, Ephesians tells us, and we have to be outfitted for battle against the satanic influence of this world. Satan cannot be everywhere at once, but there's a lot of demonic spirits that serve Satan. And so there's a constant warfare between the good, the good and the evil in this world. We are seeing that before our very eyes. If you'll turn on your uh, news 
at night or any time during the day, we see that they're that we're worried about this new thing called ISIS terrorism. I'm going to tell you what it is. It goes beyond terrorism. That is an evil that's fighting against the power of God. And that is one way that you can know that we are living in the last of the last days. Now, the Holy Spirit is there to give us even confidence in the last days that we can stand because we're not standing in our own power. We're standing in the great and mighty power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. In John 16 and 17, we were in 14, just flip over to John 16 and verse 7, not verse 17, verse 7. And we find that he convicts us of sin. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away, unless, this is Jesus speaking, unless I go away, the counselor, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me, and in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. But the Holy Spirit, he is placed here to convict us. Even after we're saved, I'm going to tell you, as a child of God, I have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit when I have said something about someone that I shouldn't have said, when I've had the wrong attitude, when I've done something that I shouldn't have done, or when I've neglected to do what I should have done. There's two, there's two things in the believer's life. There's sins of, of uh, omission when we don't do what we should be doing, and then there's sins of commission. I'd like to say once you're saved that you're never, ever going to sin again. That's not true as long as you live in this world. I've said it before. There's that twofold nature. We live in this house called the flesh. And as long as we're in this flesh, we're going to combat evil. And evil comes from the satanic powers and Satan that's in this world. He cannot take your soul, but he wants to ruin your testimony. But through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can live a life that will bring honor and glory to God and live above what this world is experiencing. Then we find that he actually intercedes for us, the, the Holy Spirit does in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 26. It says, <clears throat> in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. There's times we don't even know how to pray. There's times when possibly we're praying and it's not God's will, but because the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. The Father knows what the Spirit is th and thinking and, and what we need, and the Spirit actually groans and intercedes on our behalf to God the Father. How much greater could that be? You know, there's times, and I've actually experienced some times in my life when I've been so down, when I've been so heartbroken, when I've been so sorrowful, all I could do is just cry out God and I will I know beyond a shadow of a doubt because every word in this book is true that the Holy Spirit has interceded for me and I have felt the peace that he gives afterwards. So these are some scriptures that you can hold on to that you should want to hold on to. Now we know that then there's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And we know that from Ephesians that, we're, that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Actually, Ephesians 5 and 18, we're told, I love the Word of God because Scripture proves Scripture. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, 
Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Filling with the Spirit. And we're going to find out some people who were filled on the day of Pentecost with the Holy Spirit and what a difference it made to those that were observing them, them at that time. Uh, speaking of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, filling... <clears throat> I told you that you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, you're given the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you're given the seal of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> but there is something that is different about the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's different than the other works of the Holy Spirit. I have a glass here, I specifically, I usually have a little bottle of water, I specifically put the water in a glass tonight, and I actually need a drink of that. Now you can see what point that the water is in this glass. Now if I had a Coke or a quart of milk that I wanted to pour in this glass, Let's just say I took the Coke and I poured it in the glass. Well, it's half, it's, I don't know, two-thirds, not quite half filled, not two-thirds, half or less filled with water. If I pour Coke in it or if I pour milk in it, the other, whatever, Coke or milk, it's going to be diluted because I've got this water in this glass. Now, as a believer, We've been given the Holy Spirit, but to totally be filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to empty ourselves of the world. Now that is easier said than done because you have that constant pulling at you from the world for this, for that, for your time. Well, I would take time for Bible study, but I've got to get this child to ball practice. I would take time for Bible study, but my favorite TV show's on. I would take time for Bible study, but I need to be here, or I need to be there, or I need to take a nap. You have to make time for God in your life. Now, if I had, if I were to empty this water and totally empty the glass, the glass would be empty. And if I wanted to fill it with the Coke or milk, I could fill it to the top, couldn't I? Well, see, if we have this much or more of the world in our life, well, I'm not totally filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's still going to be there, but guess what? The work of the Holy Spirit is going to be diluted just as the coke or the water would be diluted because I've allowed Satan to bring, excuse me, other things into my life to fill me with other things that possibly are not bringing honor and glory to God. And at the best, they're keeping me too busy to spend time in the relationship that I need to be working on with Jesus Christ. See, if you're married, <clears throat> or for those of you who may be dating, if you don't know your spouse unless you spent time with them, right? But the longer you're married and the more time you spend with them, the more you understand that person. That's the same way in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The more time we spend, the more time we spend in the Word, the more time we spend in prayer, the more we're going to know about God. The more receptive our ears are going to be to what He's saying to us, whether it be from a TV uh, preacher, from our Sunday morning services, or whatever. So the filling of the Holy Spirit is different than the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is just as we're going to find out later in this chapter where the, the, these 120 or more were filled with the Holy Spirit that day and some of those standing outside begin to say, well, they're, they're, they're drunk. They're drunk on wine. 
There was something different about them. And the others noticed that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to shine for Jesus Christ. One thing that's wrong with this world today, the light of Jesus Christ is growing dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because le more and more of God's children are filled less and less with the Holy Spirit. And then the last thing, one of the last works of the Holy Spirit is the unction. And unction I like to say, as Jim used to say, it's God on a man. It's the uh, special ability to give the Word of God, to use the Word of God with great power. And there are a lot of preachers today who may preach the Word of God, but it may not be going above the ceiling because without that unction, without that power of the Holy Spirit, it's just a bunch of words. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, I want to, to warn you. It says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. That is a warning. We're not to quench the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I'm going to tell you one reason we don't have church services like they did on the day of Pentecost, because most of the time we come in to the church service, we're filled three-fourths of the way with something else. We do not have room for the Holy Spirit to work, for us to listen, and for us to really rejoice and worship as God wants us to. So... The Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs us, but there's also a warning that we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. Now, on that day, we find also in verse 5, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the sound of the mighty rushing wind from the Holy Spirit, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they ask, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Perithians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya uh, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. There had been Jews scattered throughout all the nations I just mentioned. But yet on the day of Pentecost, a lot of them were converted. They had been Gentiles converted to Judaism. They spoke a different language, but that particular day, they could hear the gospel being preached in their own language. You have a very special privilege in the day and age we live now. You can turn on your TV set and you can listen to the Word of God, but you need to know if whoever's presenting the Word of God is telling you the truth. The way you're going to know that is to be in God's Word for yourself and study. That's what we're trying to do at Discover the Joy, bring you to God's Word right into the presence of God. Do you know Him tonight? <music>